Okay, guys. Can anyone do that? Oh, thank you, sweetheart. Can I have that? Thank you, you shot. Great. Awesome. Okay. Did anyone pay attention to the news yesterday evening or this morning and hear about something unusual that happened in Israel yesterday? Yeah. No. A plane got shot down. Okay. That is not a normal everyday occurrence I, in Caldwell, New Jersey. That is definitely not a normal everyday occurrence here in Israel either. So yesterday, what happened, we're going to pay attention to this little news clip about it, but what happened was an Iranian drone, an unmanned um, flying object, came into Israel's airspace, flew over from Syria into Israel, and Israel shot it down. And then Israel sent some planes from the Israeli Air Force to go and attack the base which had sent out this unmanned drone. And they say over 25 missiles were shot at this plane and the tail of the plane actually fell off in Syria, but the pilots made it back to eject on Israeli territory. And thank God both pilots are in the hospital now and um, hopefully they'll be okay. But this is what happened. I am not sure why that is taking so long. Oh, here we go. Okay, that's taking too long for me to wait to load. I'm sorry, guys. I don't know why that's taking so long. But as you guys heard, and I'll tell you, this is exactly what happened. And it's very unusual because, first of all, for a drone to enter into another country's airspace is an act of war. And for Iran to be sending things over Israel's border, thank God, doesn't happen every day. That's a big deal when that occurs. And certainly for something to happen, for Israeli planes to be fired at and shot at and almost downed on enemy territory is an exceptional thing and not an everyday occurrence. But it reminds us that we in Israel do live surrounded by a lot of enemies who are happy to attack us at any opportunity. And we have to be very, very grateful for our army, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, and for our Air Force and very, very grateful when they're able to come home safely. So it was a bit of an exciting uh, Shabbat in Israel yesterday. Okay, everybody sees that uh, you all have the tiny URL already for today? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so last week we ended class, if you guys remember, with Jerry telling us a story of how his father was saved by two young Polish women and the continued relationship that his father had with his rescuers and that Jerry continues even until this day with their descendants or with their family. So I'm gonna quickly share with you an abbreviated version of my husband. This is my husband's cousin Shlomo, who lives in Haifa, Israel. This is his daughter and his grandson and his younger half brother who was born here in Israel. And Shlomo was a child during the Shoah. He was eight years old when the war ended. In the beginning of the war, he was in hiding with both of his parents and his baby brother. But the Polish person who was hiding him, if you guys remember when we read last week the requirements for a righteous Gentile, and Jerry spoke about this also in his father's story, the Polish person who was hiding them wanted money. And his father didn't really trust him 100% because he felt like he would betray them, and especially if the money ran out, they would not be safe. So 
So his father decided to leave and to go and look for another hiding spot. And Shlomo, who was a young child, he was five years old at the time, was very scared to be left alone without his father and he begged to go with him. So his father took him to go look for another hiding spot. And while they were off trying to find another place or another Polish person willing to hide them, this Polish person did betray his mother and his baby brother and they were taken away and they were killed. But Shlomo and his father were very lucky. They were taken in by someone his father knew, a farmer, who took no money from them, who was completely a righteous amongst the nations. And he not only took them in and saved their lives by hiding them that time, when the Nazis were in the area and the other Polish people were looking for Jews and would have told the Nazis about them, and the Nazis were coming close to, their, to this man's farm all the time, he snuck Shlomo, he, Shlomo and his father out one night and he brought them several hours away to a cousin. And this cousin hid Shlomo and his father for more than a year. And then when it wasn't safe in that area, this cousin actually sent them back. And they, it was it's a long story how they got back. They got back to the original farmer who hid them again and kept them hidden until the end of the war and really saved their lives. And they also kept in touch for many, many years with this farmer until he died and then with his children as well. So we know that even in Poland, where the death camps were and where over 3 million Jews lived and were being killed, there were righteous amongst the nations who saved Jews. And a whole different category of these righteous amongst the nations, which I don't know if you guys know any in America, were the allied liberators of concentration camps. So who would these allied liberators of concentration camps be? Who do you think they were? Okay, who would they be? Who do you think these liberators of the camps were? Um, American people that, well, people that were in the army. Okay, so American soldiers who came and liberated the camps. Who else? Finally here tonight, a story that begins at the end of World War II. American soldiers who were fighting the Nazis and came and liberated camps. What other soldiers? What other countries? The only Americans fought in World War II? Britain. British soldiers who came, Britain. British, Canadian, Australia, and the people in the uh, British soldiers who were fighting in the British Army. Any other big army you could think of? Who was, what was the other big three? Russia, Russian. Absolutely, Russian soldiers. In fact, in Poland, where many of the death camps were located, the death camps that we've learned about are extermination camps were liberated by Russian soldiers. Okay, let's pay attention to this video which talks about a, whim, a particular woman who was in a Nazi concentration camp and her American liberator. Two. Two people, one of them caught in the horror of the concentration camps, the other a man who arrived on the side of the liberators. Now, almost 70 years later, their story has come full circle. We get the story tonight from NBC's Rahima Ellis. I never forget it. At almost 90 years old, Marsha Kruzman is still haunted by the horrors of the Holocaust she lived through as a teenager. We didn't exist to them. We've been just air, pushed to death, kill, murder. You cannot imagine this. Kruzman spent five years in concentration camps. She was even forced to dig her own father's grave. They murdered him in front of me. And I have to put the wood on top of him and burn him because they didn't want to leave the evidence. It's hard, to, it's hard to talk about these things. Her brother and her mother also killed. At 18 years old, Kruzman weighed just 68 pounds. In 1945, she was at Mauthausen, standing in a line of people being led to their death when the Americans arrived. I was sitting outside the crematorium. And I remember, like today, 
the noise when they say you're free, you're free. Cruzman never got to thank the soldiers who rescued her. She became a nurse, moved to America, and married another Holocaust survivor. You did find love in your life. Oh, yes. My husband, he was a nice man. To honor his memory, her parents, brother, and the six million Jews killed, Cruzman has spent years telling her story to school groups and others. What's it mean to you when you look at all these thank you oh, I, cards? I love it. That's, that's what I wanted. That means I achieved something. Little did she know, someone else had been doing the same thing just a few miles away, but from a different point of view. Joe Barbella served in the U.S. 11th Armored Division that helped liberate concentration camps. For years, he also spoke to students, sharing pictures he took and letters he sent home. But for Cruzman, never meeting any of the Americans who saved her life was a nagging regret. Then, last October, she was reading a local newspaper. My hands fell down. I nearly fainted. In a story about a couple's 65th wedding anniversary, the man in the article was Joe Barbella, who helped liberate Mauthausen. I still have a shock, really and truly. After nearly 70 years of searching, a survivor met her liberator. What did you say to Joe? I love you. Yes. Thank you for liberating us. I'm so thankful that we saved you because we became give me such kiss. friends. Give, give me a kiss. And now they share a friendship rooted in a life-changing moment decades ago. Rahima Ellis, NBC News, Union, New Jersey. Okay, guys, who noticed where these people were from? Union, New Jersey. It's not that far from Caldwell, New Jersey. And there are hundreds, I'm sure, of veterans living in the state of New Jersey, living in New York and New Jersey, who also participated in liberating concentration camps. Remember, we talked about there being 40,000 concentration camps across Europe. It's and okay, as baby. all of these allied armies marched across Europe, they opened the gates and they freed the Jewish prisoners and all the non-Jewish prisoners who were in the camps. So I'm going to ask you guys to come onto slide number four, and I want you to click onto here into this today's meet, and I want to hear your reaction and your responses. We talked a little bit about, remember, we listened to that story, uh, to the reflections of Budmila, an old Polish lady, about what life was like in Auschwitz when she was a young Polish girl. And we talked a little bit about why people would help and maybe why people wouldn't help. So I would like you guys to reflect a little bit in this today's meet on your responses to people who hid Jews and people who liberated Jews. Okay, so let's click into the today's meet. Everybody remembers you type in your nickname, here are your name. Max got us started already. And you click join. People are important. Okay, other adjectives that you can think about. Certainly important. We saw in that video how important it was for this woman to thank her liberator even 70 years later. Heroic acts of kindness. Anything you guys found surprising about stories that you read or heard about people who hid Jews? brave, amazing people, kind people, okay? We're thinking that kind of a uniform idea here that most of the people who risked their lives did it out of kindness. Any other ideas or reasons that we might think that people would have risked their lives to hide Jews? Brave, 
Okay, some of them we heard, we heard in Jerry's story, we heard in my family's cousin's story, money was sometimes involved. Selflessness, thinking about others, a certain humanity, brave people. Maybe for some of them, maybe Jacqueline, that's a good point. Maybe for some of them, it was a form of resisting the Nazis. Some of them certainly did it for the money. And by the way, there were many Jews who paid their rescuers who felt that they were contributing to their food or to their well being or that their rescuers deserved something for risking their lives. They still risked their lives to save them. Okay, out of, a, out of a need to help people or a desire to help people for sure. Out of a sense of righteousness. They knew what was happening was wrong. Sometimes it wasn't just about being kind. Sometimes it was, as, as someone else said, taking a stand in, against the Nazis, resisting or to stand up and do the right thing. Okay, then how does it make you feel to know that these might be all these amazing qualities that these people had, that only 26,000 people in all of Europe risked their lives and were part of these kind, amazing, incredible people? Or even if we're cynical and saying they did it for the money, only 26,000 people risked their lives. Nobody has any thoughts about that? There are people typing. Jerry, maybe I'll put you on the spot and I'll ask you. How do you think it affected your father? As a, obviously his life was saved, but how did it affect his outlook on life after the Shoah? The fact that these young girls risked their lives for him and his sister. So it was actually my, you know, although he was saved by these women, my father had a very negative feeling towards Germany, towards Poland, uh, he, 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 you know, he, he was very negative uh, against them. I think we were the only people I know who, who had a television that was not made in Japan even. But my father would, <laughs> my father would buy it, it was not made in the United States. It made my father, you know, talking about the, you know, in the, the, what you said before, we meeting the soldier, my, my father was a, a very, very pro-American. Uh, he thought America was the best place on earth. My father, when he went to my father, when he went for his master's, he wrote a paper that said, "I am the I can run for president of the United States," even though he was born in another country. Because his life, he said, in Poland was not a life, and he wasn't born until 28 years later. He was born in the United States when he came to America. So, guys, right. do you find that surprising? Do you think Jerry's father? Can you understand Jerry's father's attitude? Why yeah. he would be very angry at the Poles and at the Germans? And love America so much. Right. One one last thing I can tell you that he went back. For you guys, it's a long time ago. For Lori and I, it's not. In 1992, he went back to Poland, and he went met with the ladies who were both. They were old. My father was already old, and my father, you know, was an Orthodox rabbi, and they made all kinds. And they were poor. They made all kinds of food for them, and my father ate it all. Right, although it was definitely not kosher, 
right? My father never put anything non-kosher food in his mouth in his life. And when I asked him about it, he said he knows for sure God would forgive him for eating the non-kosher food, but God would never forgive him for embarrassing those ladies uh, by not eating the food that they probably spent a lot of their money on to prepare. Wow. That's really unbelievable. Well, it also shows you the level, the understanding, your father's understanding of really how it was so profound and so amazing, the risks that they took to save his life and his sister's life. So it's kind of understandable. You know, a, a lot of the things that you guys raise and, and kind of that attitude of being very angry at Germans and being very angry at Poles or Hungarians or Lithuanians or people who either participated in persecuting Jews during the Shoah, or just kind of stood by and watched and let it happen. A lot of Jews after the Shoah walked away with those attitudes. But there was someone else that Jews were angry at after the Shoah. Anyone want to take a stab or a guess at what else might have raised the anger of Jews? Oh. Okay, people who just let it happen for sure, bystanders. But I'm thinking of it's that we're personifying, not really a person, more of a being that people might have turned their anger at after the war. Uh, Jordan. God. At God. Okay. So the war ends. Okay, Jordan, you're going ahead and you're going ahead to the next slide. Okay. Um, the war ends, and here. Many, many Jews who had been religious before the war, many Jews were not religious, but many Jews were religious before the war. Many Jews who weren't religious had some kind of a connection or relationship to Judaism or God. They show our ends, and there's a lot of anger. And I think for us too, we sat here, it's hard to understand how only 26,000 people could have tried to help Jews. It's a whole nother layer of trying to understand how this could have happened. And how do you hold on to faith or a relationship with God after the Shoah? So that's what we're going to spend the rest of today's class looking at, which is faith after the Shoah and our relationship with God. What kind of questions do you think you would want to ask God about the Holocaust? Let's throw out a couple now, and then we're going to kind of look at this through the rest of the class. Yeah. Uh, I think they would ask uh, if God, like, why would you make so much, like, death and, like, death and, like, what the Nazis did, why would you stop that? Okay. Why would you make the Nazis in so much death? Okay, that could be a question. Any other questions? Anybody else? I'm sure you all have questions. else? Okay, you know what? These are big questions. In a little bit, I'm going to ask you guys, you're going to kind of record a conversation at the end of our class today with God to ask these questions. So Jordan, you know what? Hold on to your question for now. And we're going to kind of explore and tease out a little bit this idea about faith and how faith was affected differently in different people's experience of the Shoah. So I'm going to ask everybody to come on to slide number seven. Does someone want to read for us this quote by Helen Keller? Yes, I love it. Faith is the strength by which the shattered world shall emerge into blood. Okay, does anyone want to take a stab at, ex at explaining that quote? Yes. You can have faith if you're blind or like have a disability. Okay, now you're taking the blind because you know it's from Helen Keller. Okay, but let's look at the words of the quote. So we know that Helen Keller was blind, so that adds something to how we see the quote. Yeah, loud. Um, Okay, exactly. I mean, what she was saying here in this quote is sometimes even when everything looks completely shattered or broken, having faith can help 
make things better, it can help bring you to the light. So I'm gonna ask you guys to click into this Padlet. Hello. Where I've given you a bunch of quotes about faith. And I'd like you to read through them and just respond to one with your idea. Like I responded here to this quote from Rabbi Hillel. Hillel and Shammai, the famous sparring partners in the Talmud. Even if I know that I would die tomorrow, I would still plant an apple tree today. And I said, I love the promise of continuity, of covenant held in this quote. I can hold on to the power that future generations will blossom even if something terrible happens to me today. So I'd like you guys to look at these quotes and just pick one to comment on, why it speaks to you, why you like it, why it has a powerful message about faith. Okay, guys, let's take another couple minutes. Okay, I see that a lot of people responded to the Mitch album quote here. Jerry, do you want to call on someone to read this quote and then somebody who commented on it? Would like to read the Mitch Alvin quote? Sure. Don't all raise your hands at once. Excellent. Why don't you read it for us? Nice and loud. Go on. Okay. Uh, why don't you read it for us? You're still typing. Somebody, somebody read for us. Okay, why don't we ask Abby, since she wrote such a nice quote, and she wrote such a nice comment about it. Okay, Abby. Okay, uh, many of you guys commented on this and you all commented on that kind of that aspect of doing. And many people after the Shoah kept their faith or found their faith by continuing to do, to engage in trying to have a relationship with God, to engage in trying to have a relationship with Judaism and observing the mitzvot. And that was one way to try and hold on to faith by doing. Okay. A few of you, Eliana and Justin, you like the Rabbi Hillel quote that I read. Do one of you want to share? Donnie, also, you wrote something very nice there. Do you want to share why, one of you, why you related to that quote? Well, I thought that it kind of meant that it, yes, I thought it was, that was like powerful because it's 
Absolutely. What's one thing that people did after the Shoah that was an enormous leap of faith? And Jerry is like living proof of that. What they do? No. Mm. Absolutely. They had children. You guys aren't there yet, but when you get there, you'll understand that deciding to bring a child and raise children in this world is an enormous leap of faith. And many, many, if not most survivors of the Shoah, like Rabbi Hillel said, you plant a tree today, even though you're not really gonna be there. Tomorrow, many went on and had children. Okay, let's just look at, I wanna look at what Jordan said on the Mother Teresa quote. So let's just look at that. Does someone wanna read the quote from Mother Teresa? Teresa? Okay, so maybe Mother Teresa's approach or what Jordan said, you know, if you can start with the small things, I asked you guys a very big question which was, what do you want to say to God after the Shoah? And how do we feel about God and what happened in the Shoah? And maybe we don't start with that question. Maybe we start with very, very small questions. And in baby steps, we can kind of come back to a conversation or an idea about faith or God after the Shoah. Okay, guys, we're going to look now at one family story. This is a story, you're gonna watch, we're gonna watch two clips, but we're gonna learn about three people in these videos. The parents of the man who's speaking, his mother and his father, who have very different attitudes towards faith after the Shoah. So in this clip that we're watching, I want you to pay attention to the very different attitudes, and then we're gonna hear from an aunt in the family who has a different experience and an even different opinion about faith after the show off. One of the consequences of the Holocaust was its effect on the faith of observant Jews. How could a just God have permitted such a tragedy? Today, the personal story, in his words, of Menachem Daum, a New York television producer whose parents were both Holocaust survivors. Daum has explored these issues of faith with survivors, including his aged father. A Hasidic master once said, a God who limits himself to actions that we humans can understand couldn't possibly be God. Essentially, that was my father's approach to the crisis of faith raised by the Holocaust. However, that was not the approach taken by my mother. On my mother's tombstone, we inscribed that she endured much suffering. This was our way of asking God to forgive her sins. In effect, we were saying she already suffered enough for them in this world. However, I don't think my mother felt a strong need for God's forgiveness. On the contrary, she told me when she is called before God in final judgment, she will turn the tables. She will demand to know why he stood by silently during the Holocaust as her large family was being destroyed. Her mother, two brothers and six sisters. Her first husband, Ubna Avram. She had a son before the war. His name was Avram. So at least we have a, some recollection of who they were. Just a few months after their liberation, my parents, Moishe Yosef Daum and Fela Nussbaum, were married in a displaced persons camp in occupied Germany. 
They named me Menachem, which means consoler or comforter. Apparently, they hoped I might be able to restore some happiness in their lives. Actually, the happiest time in my mother's life, she once told me, had been the year she spent as a student in Beis Yaakov, the network of Orthodox schools for girls in pre-war Poland. My mother told me she retained the pure faith of a Beis Yaakov girl until she got off the train at Auschwitz. But she never spoke about what actually happened on the train ramp that forever shook her faith. My mother had arrived at Auschwitz with her sister Bluma. Many years later, my Aunt Bluma revealed to me that my mother had her infant son in her arms. As they were roused out of the train, a veteran Jewish prisoner hurriedly came up to them. He knew mothers who were together with their young children would soon be directed to the gas chambers. He urged them to do the unthinkable. At the Passover Seder, my mother would get annoyed as my father recited the Exodus story. She would ask him, if God did so many miracles during biblical times, then why hadn't she seen any such miracles during the Holocaust? Okay, so here in this video, we met the parents, or the, we met Menachem Down, and heard the story of his parents, both of whom were Holocaust survivors. What kind of an upbringing or background did Menachem's parents come from? The background, how were they brought up? Do you think they had faith when they were growing up? Did they have a relationship with God? Did they know what it meant to be Jewish? Yes. And how do you know that? Tell me something that you heard in the video that gives you the information that you know. Okay, so we definitely know that Menachem's parents, certainly before the Shoah or before World War II, Menachem's parents were part of religious Jewish communities. That's the way they grew up, they had a connection with God, and they lived their lives as believing religious Jews. Okay, hold on to how the Shoah changed them. We're going to look at one more member of Menachem's family. And then I'm going to ask you guys to tell me how the Shoah, or the experience of going through the Holocaust, impacted on, affected, changed the faith of Menachem's mother, Menachem's father, and Menachem's aunt. So here we're going to hear a little bit about the story of Menachem's aunt. I cannot see a God who will allow a little baby to be killed for no reason at all. And I really lost my belief then, right then and there. I had one sister and two brothers. 
I was the oldest. I'm the only survivor of my family. Why? What did they do so terrible that they had to perish? I think if God is so great and so powerful, he could have struck Hitler down before he killed so many Jews. I, that's my feeling. That is one of the deep religious responses to the Shoah, to defy God. To take it with indifference is not a religious response. To go and rebuild is a religious response. To defy God is a religious response, because that is to take what happened with the utmost seriousness as a matter of life and death, of your own life and death. In the early 1950s, just as my father was on the verge of realizing the American dream, he gave up a good job in upstate New York and moved his family to Brooklyn. He did so in order to send us to yeshivas and give us a religious education. Most of my yeshiva classmates were, like myself, children of survivors. Our teachers, survivors themselves, never mentioned the Holocaust. I suspect that, like my parents, they too had no answers to offer us. According to Jewish religious law, my father's physical condition exempts him from the need to put on the tefillin. However, I know how much this ritual means to him. During the Holocaust, he was also exempt from putting on the tefillin. And yet in the ghettos and forced labor camps, he risked his life in order to do so. <laughs> He remembers. I try to continue my parents' ways, but to be honest, I do it more out of respect than out of conviction. I really don't understand my father's faith. I don't understand why he would risk his life in the camps for a God who had seemingly abandoned him. Nor do I understand my mother's strange combination of faith and doubt, how she continued to observe the commandments of a God she could not forgive. But there is an answer. To me, the miracle of Jewish history as a whole is our capacity to begin after tragedy, after disaster. <laughs> Menachem Daum also passed along this story. A Hasidic rabbi lost his wife and 11 children in the Holocaust. Afterwards, he was asked, why did miracles occur only during biblical times? Why don't they happen in our times? The rabbi replied, the fact that there are Holocaust survivors who, after all they endured, can still keep faith is itself the greatest miracle of all. Okay, guys, so keeping in mind everything you just saw in those two video clips that we looked at about Menachem Daminit's family, 
I want you to tell me, someone tell me, what was the response of Fela, of Menachem Dam's mother, to the Shoah? What was her response in terms of her religious practice and her faith? Um, she Okay, Jerry, that was very hard for me to hear. Okay, so she, she said that she kept fulfilling the mitzvot, right? But she did lose, like she didn't have the same faith in God that she had before. Okay, if you, she kept, she kept fulfilling the mitzvot. She was still a religious woman. She raised her son to be, uh, her children, her sons to be religious young men. But she didn't have the same faith. So if you had to pick an emotion to describe her relationship with God, what kind of emotions would you pick to describe how she felt? You hear? Okay, so frustr frustrated and hated, is that what I heard? Angry, angry. Angry, okay, frustrated and angry. Okay, I think those are great words. Too. She was clearly very, very angry. And you guys remember the story of what had happened to her. Right? She was, 